We interrupt this record to bring you a special bulletin. The reports of a flying saucer hovering over the city have been confirmed. Did you really go out with an alien? Uh-huh. What was it like? Real different. Becoming Human, a Mork and Mindy podcast. Hello, listeners. This is Paula Schaffner with episode 32, Mork's Health Hints. This first aired on November 4th, 1979. You might think from the title that this is an episode where he goes back to working at Rainbow's Health Food Store, but the IMDb synopsis is Mindy goes to the hospital to have her tonsils removed, but a mix-up finds her being prepped for brain surgery. Yes, it's comedy gold. This is the 23rd episode directed by Howard Storm and the fifth written by David Misch. Quite a few guest stars, especially for this point in season two, and I'll go into those as we go along. We start with the daytime exterior, the deli, and I'll mention right now that there are no scenes set at Mork and Mindy's apartment. There's a good number of customers, and Jeannie tells Remo that one of them wants bean sprouts and alfalfa sprouts on a bed of shredded lettuce. Remo asks if the man wants to eat lunch or graze. Jeannie says she doesn't care if the man smokes it as long as he pays the check. Sort of a genie drug joke, I guess. Remo says to ask the man if he'd like a plate or a feed bag. Mork enters and says, Buta, Kimba, stay with the caravan. And he's wearing a pith helmet with a net, so he's like an African explorer, I guess. He tells all the germs they're going to bite the dust, and he says, Die, you little buggers, and he sprays them with his spray bottle. He tells the middle-aged man with a hamburger to drop it. He also says to spread those buns, which was a bit suggestive. Mork tells the germs that he has the right to read them their rights. They have the right to remain basilis. I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. Then he sprays some more. He says that one of the germs pulled a gun. Remo pulls him away and says to cut it out. Mork says that Mindy is going into the hospital, so Mork has to kill germs. He sprays Remo, who objects. Then Mork yells, you behind the gherkin, freeze. He says it's another streptococcus, a small one. He acts out the little germ screaming as he drops it and smushes it with his foot. He sprays a young couple as they leave. Jean yells after them that there aren't any germs in here. Now, there are germs everywhere you go in life. She should know this as a doctor. The question is whether there are harmful germs and a large number of them. Mork says there are no germs in here after his spritzkrieg, a pun on blitzkrieg, and then he says in the name of Louis Pasteur, but then before he can make his statement, he realizes that he just committed germicide. There are millions of little germs at home going, where's daddy? In a different way, we have a conflict between Mork the tough guy and Mork the sensitive guy. Remo asks about Mork's noticeably shorter hair. Mork says he cut off all the germy parts. It was cheaper than having it cleaned. And I'm not sure of the exact timing on filming, but I think that this may have had to do with him shooting Popeye, or at least preparing for the movie Popeye, which would come out in December of 1980, but they worked on it quite a while. I think January to May. I'll have to look that up. Mindy enters and asks if it's safe yet. She says she's going to have her tonsils out, and Mork has been running around driving her crazy. He says she shouldn't talk. She should rest her tonsils for their coming out party, and he's going to translate. You're going into the hospital. Yes. Mindy, Mindy. <laughs> it is true that Miss McConnell is going into the hospital for a treatment of the knuckle infection. But soon, she'll be back to her old uninfected self and back being so cute and adorable and shiksa like. So, yes, we get more calling Mindy a shiksa again for at least the third time this season. Jeannie says there's nothing to worry about. Lots of people have their tonsils out. Remo says he had his out in the first grade. Jeannie says he was only 14, and instead of arguing this, he says, so I was old for my age. Mork asks if Remo put them under his pillow for the tonsil fairy. Remo says he doesn't believe in that stuff, he just put it in a jar. Remo says getting your tonsils out is a breeze. Jeannie agrees that it's a very simple procedure. Remo says most of the doctors know what they're doing. Mindy says most of the doctors? Mork says, Mindy, I'll handle this, and then he says, most of the doctors? 
Remo thinks there are losers in every profession. For instance, the electrician has been out here six times to fix that lamp and it's still broken. Imagine if that was your heart. Mindy sarcastically thanks him. Jeannie says Mindy doesn't want to hear all this. Remo says Jeannie comes home from medical school with all those funny stories. He wants her to tell them the one about the doctor who left the instruments inside the patient. They never would have found out, but the guy went disco dancing and gave himself an appendectomy. Remo laughs a lot at this. Jeannie says occasionally accidents happen, but not often. Not enough to let it upset Mindy. Mindy sarcastically thanks her and says she should go check herself into the hospital before these two change her mind. Jeannie says good luck. Remo says they'll visit. Jeannie says, well, kid, break a larynx, like it's showbiz and breaking a leg. Mindy again sarcastically says thanks. Mork says he'll make her wooden tonsils and then put in a scarecrow on her tongue to scare the woodpeckers away. So I don't know if that's like a George Washington wooden teeth joke. As they leave, he does a deep voice to show how she'll sound if a tonsillectomy doesn't work out. A few things to cover here. One, the deli food customer jokes still aren't working. It's not terrible, but it's just kind of eh. Adults do sometimes get their tonsils out, but for some reason it seems to happen disproportionately in the Gary Marshall universe. The episode Fonzolectomy had aired on Happy Days a couple years earlier, and Fonzie was about the age or a little bit younger than Mindy is here. Also, we get this strange thing of Mork wanting to protect Mindy even when she doesn't really need it, although that is a setup for much of the rest of the episode. And we get Jeannie defending her future profession, and I do have to wonder here and later, if Remo is so skeptical about medicine, why is he helping to put his sister through med school? We get a nighttime exterior of a hospital, and a girl is counting. She's up to 7,048. She's trying to see how long it's been since she buzzed for a nurse, so I guess she doesn't have a watch and there's no clock in the room? Mindy, whose hair is in pigtails, says there's got to be some way to get a nurse in here. The girl says to just fall asleep and the nurse will come in and wake you up. Mort comes in and asks how Mindy's feeling. She says she's all right. He brought her a little something to show he was thinking of her. It's a cauliflower with a ribbon around it. He says it's a brain, since cauliflowers look a little bit like brains, and he says actually it's a flower, cauliflower. It was the biggest one he could find. He hopes she has a short, fat vase for it. Either that, or she can wear it behind your ear. So that's both the thing of wearing a flower behind your ear and cauliflower ears. By the way, this is one of the funniest parts of this episode. He does his bark laugh and she thanks him. He asks if she's fixed yet. The little girl asks if that's what Mindy is in here for. She had her cat fixed and he hasn't been the same since. Mindy says no, she's getting her tonsils out. The little girl says that's what her mother said they were doing to the cat. Mindy tells Mork her operation isn't until tomorrow. Mindy introduces the little girl as Susie. Mork says, Nanu Nanu, bite-sized person. Mindy says the hospital's low on space, so they put her in the children's ward. And I guess that's why she's wearing pigtails to blend in? Or maybe they figure it's easier with her surgery, even though that's not till the next day? but it kind of infantilizes her. And there's some stuff done with Mindy's character in this episode, but I'll talk more about that later. A tall black nurse comes in and calls Mindy honey. She asks if she's ready for her tests. Mindy says she thought she was supposed to have them over an hour ago. The nurse says she's the only nurse working three floors tonight, and we'll later find out that the hospital is at least six floors. So she's not the only nurse in the building, unless like lower floors are the cafeteria and admittance and so on. This nurse says a lot of nurses are out, and she guesses something is going around. Makes it sound like the flu or colds or something. Mindy gets into the wheelchair that the nurse brought in and tells Mork she's got to go now. She has to take more blood tests. Mork wishes her good luck and says he hopes she passes. He tells her not to let anyone cheat and look over her shoulder to see her corpuscles. The nurse bets she knows which ward Mork is from, implying the psych ward. Mindy says Mork is just visiting. The nurse says that Mork ought to be leaving. The visiting hours are almost over. Mork and Mindy say goodbye to each other, and he wishes her good luck. Then the nurse wheels Mindy out. Mork tells Susie he's not really worried because Mindy told him that she had the best doctor. Susie says her mom told her that she had the best doctor. Mork wonders if everyone has the best doctor, where did all the dead people come from? Susie guesses that the stork brought them. Mork asks if this is her first time in the hospital. Susie says it's her second. Her first time was when she was born. She did a dumb thing and she swallowed her bubble pipe. 
She was jumping rope and it wasn't a pretty picture. Now she's full of bubbles. She says if Mork pushes her stomach, he could probably feel the bubbles. Mork says, no way, I saw Alien. So that's the second reference to the movie Alien. Mork makes himself at home and he sits up in Mindy's bed. He tells Susie that back where he comes from, they don't have hospitals. There's a little building you drive up to and you tell your ailments to a clown face and out comes a pill. Susie guesses this is a dock in the box because it's like the Jack in the Box clown. Mork wonders how they'll get the bubble pipe out of Susie. She guesses that they'll cut her open. He thinks she's kidding, but she's serious. Now he thinks maybe he should stay and protect Mindy. She could get her insides on the outside and then her liver would get caught in her pantyhose. Susie says they'll put back everything that's important and it won't hurt because they knock you out first. Mork wonders who does this and Susie says it's guys with masks. Mork says, masks? Whoa, Kimosabi. So there's another Lone Ranger reference. Susie thinks they wear masks because maybe they don't want you to see when they goof up. The nurse returns and says to Mork, oh, you're still here. He confides to Susie that they are goofy. He's here and the nurse doesn't even know it. The nurse says that visiting hours are over. Mork says he's got to stay here and protect Mindy. He's seen a lot of strange things happening in this place. The nurse assures him that Mindy will get excellent treatment. Mork is worried that they'll cut Mindy open and auction off her innards. He's seen them in little bottles. He tells the nurse that he cares for Mindy a lot. She's like a brother to him. So the nurse says, don't worry, your brother Mindy will be fine. Just as soon as she comes out from under the knife. Mork says, knives, masks. What's the name of this hospital? Our Lady of Central Park? So a mugging joke. The nurse waves goodbye and Mork waves back and reluctantly leaves. There's a cut to Susie smiling and the nurse has this, we've got a live one here kind of expression. I've got to go. <laughs> Although I'm not crazy about that scene, it is actually arguably the best one in the episode. So I do want to mention nurse number one was played by Shirley Jo Finney and she had credits going from 73 to 93. And I like how she's firm but kind. She has a sense of humor. She's doing her best to reassure the patients and Mork. And I thought it was nice that they cast an African-American actress in a role that didn't require that, especially because of how race is handled in a later scene. Susie is played by Michelle Downey, whose first credit was on an Out of the Blue episode, although not the one that Mork was on. And her last credit was in 1988. It's sort of this Gary Marshall casting where it seems like it's a 14 year old playing a nine year old, but I don't know how old she actually was. They're making her seem like a littler kid than she actually looks. I thought she did pretty well with the role. We see Mork befriending her enough that when she's gone later, that's upsetting to him, although less than what happens to Mindy. And it was nice to have her and the nurse reacting to Mork and Mindy. If the episode had been more like Fonzolectomy, where it's about how there's the fear of an operation, but it turns out to be okay, it certainly would have been a better episode. The closest Laverne and Shirley equivalent is when Shirley has an emergency operation and she's really scared and she wants to leave the hospital. She and all of her friends are dressed up as Alice in Wonderland characters, so that's where some of the humor comes from. I'm not sure what the funny part would have been here, but maybe just more dealing with the hospital and maybe he would have wandered into another ward and befriended somebody, befriended an old man, and I don't know. There were different ways that they could have gone with this in the rest of the episode. I have issues with David Mish as a writer, but I'll talk about that more later on. Now we get a daytime exterior at the hospital. There's a voiceover paging Dr. Newman to pediatrics. I would have thought, ah, this is setting something up, but no, it's actually just Fuller. There is no Dr. Newman in this episode. Me and it's moi, more. Still in one piece? Uh -huh. I think she's sleeping. Susie, boy, we've been through some changes. Oh. Min, Min, <laughs> Min, wake up, you don't want to sleep through your operation. <laughs> You're not Min. What happened to Min? I mean, what's going on here? Who's, Min? Who's Mindy? 
You're a strange man. Not as strange as people who work in this place. Oh, man, for Susie, and then what happened to the mom? What's going on here? This is really strange. What are you talking about? Well, don't you understand confused, Babel? <laughs> So yes, that is a young Kim Fields. And at that time she was 10 years old, but she was already a TV veteran. She had done the short series, Baby I'm Back. And at this point she had been on Facts of Life for a few months because it had just started in August. I'll just say right now, she does fine in the role. She doesn't get as much to do as Michelle Downey did as Susie, but it's cute. Obviously, they're doing the swap of a white child for a black child to, sorry to say this, disorient work even more than seeing the Asian kid replacing Mindy. And we don't know who the little Asian American girl is because she doesn't have any lines. Partly a visual joke, but it's also leading to things becoming complicated. Then we get nurse number two, who is a middle-aged blonde in a cast, and I'll talk about that actress more later. She comes in and Mork asks about Mindy, but this nurse, number two, says there's no Mindy here. She thinks Mork is in the wrong room. Mork says Mindy has to be here because she was here yesterday. The nurse doesn't know anything about that because she broke her wrist yesterday and had to go out to get it fixed. And she laughs at the idea of getting her wrist fixed here, which suggests that this is not a good hospital. And all of those reassurances from the first two scenes are about to become totally meaningless. Mork says it's got to be the same room because there's the flower that he brought her. Apparently they didn't take the cauliflower when they relocated Mindy. The nurse asks Mindy's name and age. Mark says she's Mindy McConnell, age 23. Eh. He does that sort of hand gesture. Mindy had turned 22 last spring. So yeah, she's 23-ish, but this is the beginning of the writers kind of forgetting how old Mindy is, which gets ridiculous in season four. Mork says that Mindy has two good arms, and then he says sorry because he didn't mean to offend the nurse. The nurse says this is the children's wing. There are no big people staying here. Mork realizes that Mindy is lost. The nurse says that she's bound to turn up sooner or later. Mork hopes it's soon because she needs a tonsillectomy. And then the nurse says she hopes that Mindy hasn't been confused with somebody else. And she laughs as she says that Mindy might get the wrong operation. They both laugh. Then the nurse says, not again, not after last week. They both laugh some more, but now he's starting to sound worried. She says this certainly is a crazy place to work. And his laughter turns to sobs. That first scene in the hospital, this is a nice place to stay, there's nice patients, there's a nice nurse. These other patients may be nice, but they're not the patients Mork was expecting to see. This nurse is the opposite of reassuring. She's sharing information that I'm sure would get her fired if she revealed to the public. But she doesn't seem to mind Mork knowing that this is a crappy hospital that she herself did not use in her hour of need. Nurse number two is played by Barbara Kaysen, who had various roles, but I most recognize her as Gary Shandling's mom on It's the Gary Shandling Show. I'll just say right now, she had much, much better material on there. The way that she and Gary Shandling played off of each other is very funny. She was believable as his mother. Here she's given pretty much an unplayable role. That will become even more apparent as we go on. We get a different daytime exterior of the hospital. There's a middle-aged man on the phone. He tells Sir that he'll try to help him with his problem. He says there are a number of nurses who don't speak English, so he should try to be patient and point to where he's bleeding. Borderline racist and, again, emphasizing that this is a crappy hospital where you will not really be helped. The intercom buzzes. The receptionist named Miss Chayefsky. Yes, she gets a name. The nurses don't. We don't even see Miss Chayefsky. Sorry, this just really grates on me. And I don't know if that's a reference to Patty Chayefsky. But I think it might be because looking at Wikipedia, in the early 70s, he made a movie called The Hospital, which was inspired by his wife receiving poor care at a hospital. And then, of course, by 1979, he was most famous for the movie Network with the I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take anymore. So, yeah, I think that is actually a little in-joke. One of the better bits of writing now that I think about it, but still not a great script here. Miss Chayefsky, through the intercom, tells this man that a gentleman is here to see him and he seems very upset. Mork enters and says that this man has to help him find Mindy. 
The man asks if this is him, and Miss Chayefsky says, mm-hmm. Mork asks if he's the administrator. He gives him a $1 bill because everyone in the hospital says that the buck stops here, so Truman reference. The man tells Mork to calm down. They won't get anywhere if Mork doesn't speak slowly and clearly. So Mork tries, but he soon babbles. So a lot of Mork babbling this episode because he's upset. Mork explains that his friend Mindy checked into the hospital and now she's gone. The man says he feels terribly sorry. Mork says Mindy isn't gone belly up. She's disappeared. She's lost. The man says she must be somewhere in the building. How far can she get in bare feet in a gown that opens down the back? He's sure that everything will be fine. He asks Miss Chayefsky to get the lawyers on the phone and say that the eagle has landed. So that's kind of a strange use of the Buzz Aldrin quote about the moon landing because it would work better if it was a quote associated with the disaster. Miss Chayefsky says, again? This man says, ixnay. So there is a pattern of terrible things happening at this hospital. Mork thinks they should be getting an organic posse with tonsil sniffing dogs. The administrator says in good time, but first there's some paperwork, and he takes out a bunch of loose paper, but then he hands Mork a form on a clipboard. And I guess that's meant to be funny, but it was kind of like, eh. Mork wonders if this is a missing persons form. The administrator says it's a formality. No matter what's happened, the hospital won't be held responsible. Mork says they are responsible because Mindy didn't lose herself. The administrator says he doesn't blame Mork for being upset, but these things happen. It's a very big place with lots of halls. Mork says there are lots of wards, like a maze. Here a ward, there a ward, everywhere a ward ward. And that's a foreshadowing of them thinking that Mindy's last name is McDonald. There's a page calling Dr. Fine, and Mork says the doctors don't answer their calls, and he wonders if the doctors are missing too. The administrator says, no son, try to see it from my point of view. He says that they don't give him enough staff, and they don't give him enough money. All they give him is the challenge to help people. Mork asks, what about finding his friend? The administrator says, now you have a challenge too. He tells Mork before he goes he should sign the form. He can't help him if Mork doesn't sign it. Mork questions this, that they'll leave her lost unless he lets them off the hook. The administrator says he doesn't make the rules, which seems odd for an administrator, but I guess he's just enforcing the rules. Also, it doesn't really make any sense, like, oh, we're not going to look for your friend because you didn't sign paperwork and therefore you're more likely to sue us because we didn't look for her and find her. Just even within the scene, it doesn't make logical sense, even in a bureaucratic sense, if this is supposed to be a satire bureaucracy. Mork takes back his buck and he says he won't stop until he finds Mindy. The administrator says he can't find her because visiting hours are over. Mork says that rescuing hours have just begun. So he's heroic in this episode, trying to help his friend. So I do like that aspect, although not crazy about what we have to do to get there. The administrator asks, what about my form? And Mork tells him, take your form and file it. And he says it like he's telling him to shove it. And he exits. The man looks frustrated and he goes back to his desk. There's yet another exterior of the hospital, so it really must be a huge hospital. Mindy is in a different room, although it looks pretty much like the other one, just with different set decoration. The woman in the other bed has a bandaged head. Nurse number two tells Mrs. McDonald that she's in her room. Mindy laughs at that last name, but doesn't challenge it. The nurse tells her that she's going to be taking another of those little pinky drinkies. So even though she's not in the children's ward, she's still being condescending. Then Mindy can rest. Mindy says she's too tired to rest. She doesn't feel good. The nurse helps her sit up and says soon she'll have her brain operation and the headaches will just disappear. Mindy drinks from a paper cup. The nurse tells her to lie back and rest. Mindy laughs and says she's starting to feel better already. The nurse exits. The other woman says brain surgery isn't as bad as it sounds. She puts her hand to her head and says, it is noisy though. Mork enters dressed as a doctor. The woman calls him doctor and he calls her sicky. But she's not offended, and she says, Doctor, I hate to complain, but nobody came by to change my dressing. He says, Dressing? Are you kidding? That gown is you. It goes perfectly with your hat. It just needs feathers, rhinestones, and nine tonne leaves. I just looked those up, and tonne leaves are in mummy movies, and looks like nine leaves gives the mummy strength and mobility, but you don't want to go beyond that. And I'm surprised he didn't do this as a stereotypical gay fashion designer like you might have expected. The woman says, Doctor, you have a very funny bedside manner. Mort says he believes that good doctors leave their patients in stitches, and he does his bark laugh. And the woman says that she used to have a good laugh. And yes, this is about 20 years before Patch Adams. 
Oh, Doctor, you know what? <laughs> what? And the audience just seems to find this character really funny, and I found it uncomfortable. I'll mention right now that that character appears to be named Virginia, although I don't think she's referred to as that. And she's played by Anita Dangler, who had film and TV credits from 1960 to 1999, so about a 40-year career. And she would, spoiler, appear on this series again as Exidor's mother. So we'll talk more about her there. Mork hugs and kisses Mindy, and Virginia, of course, notices, so Mork says hello, and this is the best type of physical therapy. It gives the patient something to live for. He tells Miss McConnell that they'll have her out of there in a fribbit, and he explains to Virginia that that's a medical term, meaning a Surrey with a fringe on top, so an Oklahoma reference. I think we did have the word fribbit in previous episodes, one of those bizarre, unfathomable measurements of time. Virginia is eating candy from a box, like somebody brought that as a gift after her brain surgery, and she says that that girl's name isn't McConnell, it's McDonald. Mark tells her, my dear lady, so more polite than when he was calling her sicky, my dear lady, I'm a doctor, I don't make mistakes unless it's a matter of life and death or a bill. Virginia repeats what the nurse said about Mrs. McDonald getting brain surgery. Mark says she's here to have her tonsils out. Virginia says she guesses it depends on how deep they drill. Mork tries to revive Mindy, thinking that she's already had the brain surgery. He tells her all his life he's been getting her into trouble, and now he's gotten her into the biggest trouble of all, and there's nothing he can do about it. Okay, one, it hasn't been his whole life. It's been a year and a half at most. And two, how is any of this his fault? Oh, come on, Min. Hello. Min. Here we go. Here we go. Hey. Whoa. The nurse asks, Doctor, what are you doing? And he says he's checking for lumps, which could be a cancer joke, could be a joke about Mindy's chest, I don't know. He says he has to get this patient out of here right away. The nurse says, nonsense. She's going to have brain surgery in two hours. He's relieved that they haven't done anything to her yet. The nurse says she's going to shave Mindy's head. So he tells her not to shave a hair on Mindy's chin. Moore keeps saying Mindy's name and trying to revive her. She says, what's up, doc? And laughs hysterically. So it's a predictable joke, but I'll allow it. It's not as forced as a lot of the humor here. He tells Mindy that he's dressed like this because he's looking for her. She says she thinks she's over there, and she points. And the nurse and Virginia look suspicious all through this. He tells Mindy that they've got to get her out of here before the hospital turns her head into a planter. He gets her to her feet. Mindy says they wouldn't do that to old Mindy, and then she wonders what her last name is. The nurse says McDonald, so she says E-I-E-I-O. The nurse says Mindy is delirious from the sedation. Mork says this isn't Mrs. McDonald, it's Miss McConnell. The nurse thinks Mork looks familiar, so he says that she assisted him last week for a lip transplant for Mick Jagger. So at least the second Mick Jagger reference in the series. Mork says he re-diagnosed the patient and her brain is cleared up. Mindy falls back on the bed and then she bounces into Mork's arms. She says, wow, that's a great ride. Usually she gets sick from a Ferris wheel. You couldn't think of a ride that seemed more like bouncing on the bed? I mean, I don't think they had bouncy houses then, but that didn't make any sense. He turns her head away as if she's going to throw up. As they continue to embrace, he says that he's going to take her home and take her tonsils out there. And she has him backed up against the wall, and she says, You dance divinely. Do you come here often? So apparently this drug makes her super flirty and affectionate with Mark. Mork says ow as the door opens, and then they fall onto the bed with him on top, and a doctor enters. He asks the nurse what's going on here, because he can hear them down the hall. She says, Dr. Roland, I'm so glad you're here. Dr. Roland was played by Wayne Morton, and he had had two Happy Days roles along with a lot of other credits. Mork helps Mindy to her feet again, and she drapes herself on him again. The nurse tells Dr. Roland that that doctor is behaving very strangely. <laughs> Doctor, I think you should put that patient down. No, she's mine! <laughs> and we can see that Mindy looks at him like she agrees that she is Mork's. 
Dr. Roland tells Mark to give Mrs. McDonald to them. He again says that it's not McDonald, it's McConnell. The nurse insists that it's McDonald. So Mindy says, over 30 billion sold, referring to the McDonald slogan of the time. Want to see my arches, referring to golden arches. And then she falls back on the bed and shows her feet like the arches of feet. Dr. Roland says he knew he should have been a plumber. He asks the nurse's assistants. So he blocks the door and the nurse raises her cast like she's going to block Mork with it. Mork steers Mindy to the open window and it turns out they're up six stories. So Mindy says she loves stories. Mindy falls out onto the ledge. Mork climbs into the window frame. He waves a thermometer and says they don't know where it's been. So take that joke how you want. Mindy gets to her feet and smiles, touching Mork's arm. There's a cut to a shot looking down at people on the sidewalk. Mindy thanks them all for coming and promises that she'll make a darn good Miss America. Mork grabs her arm and says to be careful. There's a lot of gravity down there. A man off screen tells her to jump. She says, no, you jump. Mork grabs her and she embraces him. Dr. Roland tells the nurse they better get Mork and the patient before they fall. The nurse is clutching Dr. Roland's arm with her good hand. I don't know if that's because she's worried or because they're good friends or what's going on there. Mork tells them to stay back. Bruce Lee lives and then he does some martial arts yells and poses. He jumps back into the room and growls at the doctor and the nurse. He bites the nurse so she slugs him with her cast so I guess it was an effective defense. The administrator enters and we find out that his name is Mr. Burnett. He was played by Vernon Weddle and he had many credits from 1969 to 1990. Amusingly, he would be playing a character named Mr. Weddle on Three's Company the next year. And we can see in the background that Mindy is walking along the ledge to the opposite window. I actually would have liked it if she had crawled in that window and they're like, oh my gosh, where'd she go? She jumped and then she came back in through the door. That would have actually been funnier than what we get. Mr. Burnett says to Mark, oh, there you are. I had a feeling you were on this floor when we found Dr. Brody in a closet wearing underwear and striped suspenders. Dr. Roland is surprised that Mr. Burnett knows this maniac. Mr. Burnett says Mork is okay. His friend Mindy McConnell got mixed up with a patient named Mavis McDonald. So I assume Miss Chayefsky or some other receptionist straightened out the paperwork. And we can see Mindy is walking back along the ledge. Mork says Mindy's name a bunch of times, and I don't know how many times he says her name in this episode. It felt like hundreds. Even though Mindy told that man that she wasn't going to jump, she now says for her first dive, she'll do a full half gainer with a full twist summy. And I guess a summy is like a somersault. Mort grabs her and she says she's so glad he did that because she can't swim. And I can't remember if canonically it's come up about whether or not Mindy can swim. I would think she would because she lives near a lake and she's the athletic, but whatever. She laughs and Mort pulls her back into the room. Then we get a nighttime exterior at the deli. Remo, Mork, and Mindy are eating ice cream at a table and Jeannie is dishing it up. Mindy says she can't eat anymore, so Mork takes her bowl. Remo jokes that if she has any more ice cream, they'll have to send her home in a freezer bag and he's very amused by his own joke, although nobody else is. Mindy will be sore for about a day. Mork will be sore for about a week because the nurse bit him back and that must have been at some point we couldn't see. Remo says the whole rigmarole. Yes, he says rigmarole in 1979. He says the whole rigmarole proves what he always says. You've got to be sick to go to the hospital. Jeannie says, so simple, yet so meaningless. Mindy can't believe there was all that trouble over a typographical error. Mork says there were no typos on the bill. So again, I don't know if it's Miss Chayefsky's fault or who is responsible for Mindy almost getting unnecessary brain surgery. We'd never find out. But it's a happy ending, of course. Jeannie says, speaking for my future profession, first I want to apologize. Despite what happened, doctors and nurses really do want to help. You've got to help them by keeping your eyes open and asking questions. Even though Mindy was sedated and so could not really ask any questions and could barely keep her eyes open and Mork was asking questions and trying to tell the truth and he was getting ignored. So yeah, really helps to be proactive at that hospital. And Mark says, especially if you fear for your life. This is just supposed to be amusing, haha. -ha. Mindy could have died heavily doped up and jumping out the open window. Why it was open on the sixth floor, I don't know. Mark tells Mindy that he's glad he saved her from brain surgery. If not, he'd be sitting here now eating ice cream with someone he didn't know. And that someone would be her. She nods, puts her hand on her back, and asks what she'd do without him. And he says she'd probably be sitting somewhere in front of a mirror watching herself drool. 
the bit of sentimentality is immediately undercut by the person who is being sentimental. There's a nighttime exterior of the house. So yeah, kind of. We go to Mork and Medea's, but it's just for the part where Mork summons Orson. Orson coughs. Mork tells your corpulence that he sounds sick. Orson says that Mork is very observant and he's got a cold or the sniffles or something in his voice. He says that all the health clowns nearby are broken. He's trying to find a doctor, but none of them can afford him. Mork tells Orson that on Earth, people pay doctors. Orson thinks this is crazy. Without sick people, doctors would have nothing to do. Mork calls him your lumpy ship and says that he learned this week that on Earth, staying healthy is like everything else in life. It all depends on how much money you have. A class comment, although we're not going to dwell on it. Orson asks if Mork was ill. He says Mindy was, but she's all right now. Mork had to rescue her from the hospital. He says that a hospital is where earthlings are interred, which suggests like interred in a prison camp. Well, sick and not allowed to leave until they give the hospital all their money. Although I would think they would kick you out anyway if you ran out of money. Orson says this sounds like a jail. Mork says the food is worse. I think they did talk about jails the time that Mork went to jail, and I thought that they had talked about hospitals and doctors before, but I couldn't find that in my notes. But of course, there may be times that Mork is sending Orson information, we just don't see it in an episode. Orson guesses that if you get sick on Earth, you're doomed. Mork says most doctors and hospitals are quite good, and he also realized this week that while it's tough to be sick, it's also tough to be a doctor. After all, to err is human, but most people won't allow doctors to be human. Which is true to a point, but not to the point that somebody almost has their brain removed and almost falls out of a window due to negligence. And then he signs off. I rate each of these episodes on a 0 to 4 egg scale, which measures how well it fits what I'm looking for in the series. The last time I watched this episode, I might have said, you know, one and a half, one and three quarters. It's below average, but today, the more I watched, the less I liked it, the more I thought about it. It's not quite a one. There are worse episodes ahead. There were some things I liked about it, not much, but some. So I'm going with one and a quarter. That does make it the worst episode so far. I did give a one to Mork Returns, but that was because it was a Happy Days crossover that didn't have a lot of Mork. In itself, it was more pleasant than this. It's hard to know where to begin. I've already ranted some. First of all, the episode is implausible. There we get to this level of mistaken identity. It's not the worst in the Marshall verse. Three years later, Laverne DeFazio would find herself on death row through mistaken identity. Hospital mix-up that lasts less than 24 hours is not that amazing. Just the whole thing that they are really understaffed to a ridiculous extent and they can't even keep the paperwork straight. The character motivations often don't make sense. It's just sort of that things are going for the gag. Like I said, the deli scenes aren't great. The first one is just Remo and Jeannie doing the corny restaurant humor, and even Mork's material isn't great there. He is protective of Mindy, but even in the first scene, he's a little bit controlling. I feel that she's infantilized. When she's telling jokes, it's mostly because she's sedated, and so her agency is being taken away from her, and so I don't know how to feel about her flirtation and touching with Mork, which I'll get into in a bit. So even that first scene is not great. And then we get the deli wrap-up where, oh, everything's okay. Mindy got her tonsillectomy, and she's having ice cream, and she'll feel better in a day. You know, no noticeable change in her voice. I mean, the Brady Bunch episode about tonsil removal is more plausible. Just that aspect is poorly done. And just trying to put a bow on everything, you know, it's all right. Yes, this was a nightmare of a hospital, but most doctors and hospitals are fine, and most nurses, they lost Mindy, and she almost lost her brain and or her life. So who cares what most doctors do? Okay, fine, they're understaffed, they're underfinanced, but just an apology. I mean, I hope she at least didn't have to pay for the toxilectomy, you know, especially with financial troubles she's had already this season and father's out of town. And you can imagine Fred would be furious if he knew about any of this. Then Cora would go and bite everybody. 
Jeannie, because she's a doctor, she's already buying into this. You know, she apologizes, but it's just too little. What a freaking mess this episode is. I'm not always going to do this because I do realize that there's a writer's room and everybody has impact, but let's take a look at what David Mish has offered us so far. So in season one, he did Mork Goes Public, which I enjoyed. It was fun. And then we got Mork's Greatest Hits. And this was the episode where Mindy could not accept Mork's pacifism and he had to figure out a way to prevent fights without getting violent. But I didn't really like what happened with Mindy's character there. So far in season two, David Mish wrote Mork's Baby Blues, which I ranted about quite a bit that week. And he wrote Mork versus Mindy, which I also had issues with. So he's not off to a good start this season. He is definitely not contributing the better season two episodes by any means. He also wrote the next episode, which is called Dial N for Nelson. So that doesn't sound too promising but I haven't watched that in years, so we'll see. Maybe it'll be a step up. But I feel like he doesn't have a good grip on these characters, especially Mark and Mindy, and the supporting characters are not well done. They are not written as people. They do not have plausible character motivation. Remo's okay in this. We're back to stupid Remo. For a little bit, we got him being a little bit brighter. Like I said, that first half, I like the scene with the nurse and Susie and, you know, and I felt like, okay, this is nice. I can live with this. And then just Virginia, the brain surgery lady is like, you know, we don't want Mindy to end up like this. No, 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 no. <laughs> what else can I say? I also rate these episodes on a zero to four heart scale, which measures how well it supports the Mork and Mindy romance. This is a tricky one because Mindy, in a different way than in the season opener, is not herself for much of the episode. We do see Mark's concern for her. Like I said, it is overly protective in the beginning, although it's justified when she's missing and he's going to rescue her. I do see them being very affectionate, some compromising positions and so on. I'm going to go with a one and a half slightly below average because in the sense that when somebody is drunk or stoned there are aspects of their personality that come out and so Mindy being flirty with Mork then while she's under sedation might mean a little bit so it's not nothing but wouldn't turn to this episode for ship support necessarily. It's the worst episode of the series so far and we can't blame Nelson. We didn't get Mr. Bickley. They could have fit him in, like, into the deli scene. He could have gone to the hospital to help Mork rescue Mindy. If this had not taken such an implausible turn, they could have had something where Mr. Bickley was in the hospital at the same time, which has been done on sitcoms, but I think it would have been fun to see Mr. Bickley as a patient. But it is what it is. One and a quarter eggs. One and a half hearts. This is Paula Schaffner with episode 32, Mork's Health hints. Nanu, nanu, break a larynx.